Garden Sweet. Right.
All right, we got a real treat today. We got some terrific people together, and we're going to talk about what the market's giving us, what the market's taking away, what's going on right now, and uh, and what's going on in the future, so that you can invest better and try to figure out what you want to do for retirement, what you want to do with your mad money, so to speak, or what you should be doing right now, maybe just in terms of trying to save some money and put it away for whatever you want, for, for uh, college, for instance, where I just finally got done paying. It's a big deal for me. <laughs> college is way too expensive. So who's talking here? We got John Edes, the Chief Executive Officer at the Argus Research Group also a founder and board member of the Investor Side Research Association. That's a trade group for independent investment researchers. My old friend Lizanne Saunders is the Senior Vice President and Chief Investment Strategist for Charles Schwab. Sarge, our guy, Sarge Gilpo, is co-manager of the Streets Stocks Under 10 model portfolio. Didn't know if you saw him on, on CNBC the other day. It was very funny, but very, but very trenchant, talking about Apple. Equities expert. Uh, he spent more than 30 years uh, as a trader on the New York Stock Exchange floor. You should be reading his Market Recon column every morning. I retweet it after I've read it. There's only, the only time I haven't retweeted is when my wife said, get off the, uh, get off the retweet, get off the Twitter. Except yeah. for Sarge. She hates Twitter. Twitter. Yes, yeah. except for Sarge. And uh, it's important to you know that he is actually an actual reserve sergeant in the U.S. Marines and the U.S. Army while working on Wall Street. And it's almost Veterans Day, and we salute all veterans who are first serving. Thank you. And Jeff Marks, whom I work very closely with, he's the Senior Portfolio Analyst at Action Alerts Plus Club and should be very familiar to all the people who are members. And by the way, I, once again, we urge members, please send us email. We actually answer to everybody. It's very important. All right, I'm going to start with something very topical, and it's not nailed down. But we keep hearing that Jay Powell, Jerome Powell, is going to be named the Federal Reserve Chairman. And I'm going to ask, is anybody worried? Is that something we should worry about? Or is it something we should be thrilled about? I don't think we should worry. I think I think he represents continuity in approach to monetary policy. He's a consensus pillar, which is similar to both Yellen and Bernanke. Uh, he's got private sector experience, which is kind Isn't of nice that a for a change. Versus yes, just being, a, be, being someone who's taught. And I think for the most part, he is in favor of a of a deregulation uh, environment. So I think at this stage, and how it's huge all is that? How important is that? How nice is that? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of feel that uh, we got this guy Quarles who's come in, who is, replaces Tarullo. I always hear that Tarullo was the kind of guy who came into your office and put his feet on your desk and said, you're not lending to people. Uh, and I think Jay Powell is the opposite. I think Jay Powell wants people to get wealthy. And I think that Janet Yellen didn't want people to be poor. I think Jay Powell wants people to be wealthy. And that's something I think we all share. We want people to do well. Right. I, I, I would say it, it wouldn't be a bad decision to keep Janet Yellen in the in the spot. I think she's done a, a good job continuing the, point, the path the toward it's normalization. Not, right. Plus, I think Trump had an opportunity to send a bipartisan signal, uh, or he would have that opportunity. Uh, doesn't look like he'll take it, though. Well, you know, it's a good point because I think that uh, I happen to have been a big fan of Yellen, it, but that, that was that time. That was that time when we needed steady hand, don't raise rates, whatever. Now I think we have a time when you go on a Jamie Dimon conference call and he talks about how he wants to lend more, but he's afraid of the Fed. Well, I mean, you know what? Maybe you need that change of pace. But yes, I salute Janet Yellen. And anybody who does that much public service, I mean, can we just accept the fact that's, that's a win for America? I'm, I have to admit I have not been a fan of Janet Yellen's really? over the years. Uh, I, I'm also willing to accept that I may be wrong on this because things are turning out better than I thought they would. I was one of the naysayers. But the song isn't over yet. And I'm not going to say, I'm not going to be one of those guys who takes a parting shot at her or anything like that. But I am thrilled that we have in Jay Powell a guy that, like you said, Lizanne, is going to maybe not stray too far from what was already the trajectory of monetary policy. And he's going to hopefully take a lesser lesser stance on regulation. I mean, mm -hmm. you mentioned Daniel Tarullo, and this is the guy that said on the way out, I'm sorry, I, I went too far. Yeah. But he waited until that day. Uh, maybe you want to say something as you get maybe a year out from where you're going to leave the Fed. Maybe you say, oh, we went too far. Maybe you want to fix this on your own instead of saying, here you go. It's your problem now. Yeah. I wasn't very impressed with that. All right. Uh, uh, Jeff, you know, when we got cash, uh, in some ways, we probably wanted the market to go down with something like this, an exogenous fact that doesn't influence the companies that we're investing in. Yeah, and I mean, and, and buying, the, buying these dips have been a great strategy so yeah. far this year. Um, I mean, just back to Powell, though, I mean, I, I, I like the, his dovish tone. I think he's, you know, the Fed's going to stay pretty pragmatic in their approach. Um, and I like that, you know, the market 
needs this type of consistency to, to churn higher, and I think that people don't like the exogenous, you know, they don't right. like the surprises. Um, we got plenty of cash, and you know, it's, it's about putting it to work in a disciplined manner, right. and I think we'll, you know, along with the Fed, you know, we'll have to stay disciplined and do that. Well, you, you mentioned something that I, I kind of want people to weigh in on. Uh, I, I was talking to, of all people, Karen Kramer, who we know, Sarge does, and Karen Kramer, I talk to her all the time, and she ran the trading desk, and she is saying that the buy the dips policy that I have, that we have supported, is lame. Because one day that dip will come, and it will be the dip that you bought way too early, and it will go down and down and down, and you will have used up your cash after 3 to 5% decline, and then you will not be ready. Is anyone fearful of a buy the dip strategy that so many people have adopted? I, I you know, I some of the alarm bells that are being rung by some very well-known investors out there are about the risk by virtue of market structure that if and when we get to something more than the tiny little pullback that we have blissfully enjoyed over the last year or so, that a 2 to 4% drop could quickly turn into a 10 to 15% right. drop. Right. Now, it's all speculation on everybody's parts, even the experts in some of these market mechanics that, of course, led to the flash crash. But I, I, I do think that there is a risk that at some point a lot of this momentum and the strategies associated with it could potentially feed on itself in the opposite direction than what we have witnessed. I, mean, I, I get it. I, I think that could happen. Uh, I don't know if it happens between here and your end. I think sometimes you get a, um, there's a lot, you get through September, you get through October. Now, it, it, candidly, November would therefore be the least you would expect because those other months are months that you kind of gird for it. But I, and I obviously, if I knew the event that would trigger that, I would be more concerned. But we've been dip buyers. Oh, well, that's, I mean, that's how you play this game. But why? 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 Why is it not more like the earlier 2000s where you could get stuck in a dip and then you just buy and you buy and you Jim, buy? Jim, the fundamentals are different, right? Okay. So, so the, the prices are dipping. Great. You don't just buy because the prices are dipping. You look and see what the earnings trends are doing. And we're in a real strong earnings period now. You look at other alternative investments like fixed income investments. Right. Yields are a little higher, but they're still historically low. So you've got some positive fundamentals intact that I think give you confidence to buy these dips instead of the other dips but you Let me put this to you, though. Okay, so I meet with the CEO of, of a major department store chain. And he wants to know why I'm so negative about it. And I say, I'm negative on retail. I'm negative on retail because it's bricks and mortar. And uh, I'm not impressed by yield if it's bricks and mortar because the fact is, is there's a secular change going on in shopping. I mean, I always, often feel that we have to gird, you know, we have to explain to people that a dip buying strategy works where the fundamentals are good, but we're a very sector oriented market. And the, I mean, for instance, right now, the drugs are being obliterated. Cell gene goes from 130 to 90 and nine and change. How do we know that we're buying the right sector in the dip? Well, I mean, we've been in a sector rotating environment. You don't get much of a pullback, but I do think that, uh, well, I don't just think, you just look at the data. Correlations have crashed. They've crashed across asset classes. They've crossed, crashed within asset classes. Well, explain that to people, Rosanna. So whether it's how across asset classes, the behavior of asset classes is the dispersion is much wider. Um, and then within, say, the S&P 500, it's not lemming-like behavior on the part of stocks. So individual stocks are behaving quite differently. So the dispersion between the winners and the losers is much wider. Really is. That, that's great news for active managers because it means a more level playing field relative to index type strategies. It means it's a, you know, stock picker's market. But isn't there's that ironic that we have more money going and, you know, like I always feel there's two, there's two campaigns that I rail against. And one is, is that uh, I'm not against index funds, but I always feel like, why is it that people who support index funds simply can't see the value of individual stock picking? And the second is the single stock risk thing I keep hearing about. And I look at the single stock risk of Facebook and Amazon and, you know, Alphabet, and I, I question that. And I, I think that uh, we do see it's almost too extreme in some things. Jeff and I have been battling TJX. Mm -hmm. It's a huge overweight in a retail sector ETF. And even though it has done much better than all the others, it is pulled down. Almost every day. Yeah, I mean, they have their, their off-brand uh, model is working, and they're snatching up inventories from all of these 
out, uh, closing retailers that need to offload their inventory. Um, and, and also their, their home goods, home sense uh, uh, concepts are doing extremely well. And I think, you know, when, when, um, when talking about what Amazon has done to retailers, you also have to look at, okay, so now they're bringing down the brick and mortar, but who's the play off of Amazon? Who can Amazon um, make money for? And I think that's why we just added XPO Logistics, who just reported a great quarter today, yes, into the bullpen. That's fabulous. Um, I think that's, you know, it's, that's one way you can, you know, they handle all of the last mile uh, shipping for a lot of Right, the, and the reason goods. why we liked it is because they do the last mile shipping for the large things. Now remember, UPS doesn't like to carry large. I mean, my father has always drove me crazy. My father sold boxes and bags as a retailer. And the UPS truck would come and he would have something that was a big gift wrap. Big, you know, these big, you know, if you ever go to, this, to a beautiful department store, they still have gift wrap. And it's this big. And the, the guy would say, I'm not carrying it. Mm -hmm. And like my father's like 85, he's carrying it. Yeah. UPS won't carry these, but XPO will. And right. that's the last mile is coming on very strong <clears throat> when it comes to brick and mortar. And I think that's impor important. Uh, John, I know that you mentioned technology. I saw Sarge. You've been sticking by Apple. Um, they do report. I am not asking you whether to buy it before the quarter. Your target prices no, but that's, I don't like that. You know, I mean, there's a lot of guys say, Jim, when I buy Apple before the quarter, I don't like that game anymore. And by the way, I used to. And the reason I don't like it anymore is because what it says is I'm purely catalyst driven and I don't want to be catalyst driven. I want to be longer term because the analysts are so quick to, you know, last Friday, there was support out of uh, South, uh, East Asia that they uh, that Apple had cut orders for the 10. And then Monday, we learned that they doubled orders for the 10. I my work with Apple has said that the latter story is true, but. Talk about Apple for people in terms of a longer term investment. Let's say the company reports and they report a good quarter. Um, we don't have to worry about it. Okay. Let's say they report and you know you've got what I regard as nitpicking analysts who will say, okay, well look, that, you know, the eight isn't what I'm worried about, or it's the first time I'm worried about the camera, I'm worried about the gross margins because of DRAM prices. What do you tell investors about uh, a longer term position where you think the stock is uh, good? For, and what would make you sell it if that you heard tonight. What would you say, what would make you say, you know what, I'm done with Apple? Uh, it would take a lot for me to be done with Apple. Really? Uh, I think, yes, there is probably pent up demand for the 10. This is probably going to be a catalyst for, I hope, much higher stock prices. Yeah. My long-term goal is 197 on the stock. But the, the reason to stay long Apple is the servicing of their ecosystem. That's the real story. So many people are stuck. I'm stuck with Apple. I don't necessarily I'm like stuck Apple with products. Apple. I pay them that. I'm not going to bother do you, switching. Do you click on your bill? Just an Apple invoice. Do you click on it for service revenue? I mean, I, I get back up on the cloud because I lost all my pictures. And of the things, I mean, like, uh, look, of the things that I wish that I had, I wish I had all the pictures of my dad from 2010 to 2014. But I didn't do the backup. And so I just said, well, this is like having not having car insurance. I mean, does anyone did anyone pay the service revenue besides me for because, you know, Tim Cook is saying that that service revenue is going to be equal to a Fortune 100 company, which means it's worth 28 billion. That's got gigantic gross margins because they don't have to do anything. Right. I mean, what do they do? You pay them. And it's like, what does Spotify do? Does anyone here use Spotify? I do not. I, I use Spotify. I mean, it's Why? A great, it, it's because it's a great product. I mean, they they know exactly what I want to listen to. They know songs that. I have never heard before, but just, you know, off their artificial intelligence, they can tell me, you know, based off of what I like, what other songs I'll like. It's great that they hold all of my, my songs. It's a streaming service. I don't have to waste up all of my phone data. Um, sorry, not my data, but my, my phone um, space on my iPhone that I can save for pictures, things like that, because it's all streaming. I mean, it's a great product. I, I you know, use it. I'm, a, I'm I, old I, I school do use iPod it. Nano. Okay, okay. <laughs> but, I, okay, I have a 23-year-old. So I pay the Spotify bill every, every month. I totally agree with you. Mm -hmm. It is artificial intelligence. I met with this company. They're, the guys are from Netflix, where they also know what you want to watch. And the reason I bring it up is because there's about a $20 billion valuation. I'm telling you, this, this deal is going to come. It will come maybe in the first quarter, maybe even at the end of this year. It's going to be worth $40 billion because of artificial intelligence. And, it's, and also because it's sticky. Like, you know, you pay for XM if you like sports. I do. You pay for Spotify and you pay for Netflix. These are sticky. And that's what you want because that revenue stream is gorgeous. Look, intuitive surgical. If you can get those repeat revenue streams, 
that don't the gross margins are 80 90 percent it's almost like a like a crock pot of revenue stream you you buy it you set it once and then you forget it and they just continually you you keep paying exactly yeah, right which is why exactly you have to right. the video lamb research same thing Intel. oh there was yeah. a guy on the tesla call the tesla call i find sometimes these conference calls are hilarious because there's a guy who obviously loves nvidia at, on the tesla conference call and he says hey listen i was with nvidia yesterday and nvidia their chips are 10 times better than your chips. They're much better, they're much faster. And like Elon Musk is like, so what? And the guy just put them much faster. And it was just, it was like a commercial for NVIDIA in the middle of everything because everybody, a Tesla conference call is kind of like a spitball show. It's like in detention. The people are all in detention there and they're throwing things when the teacher's not looking. It's hilarious. During earnings season, how much time do you guys spend on trying to figure out individual stocks or do you want to pull back, let it happen, and then make judgments on the sectors and see who's good? And I mention this because way too many people on Twitter say to me, Jim, okay, um, we are, we're going to get a, a number from Broadcom. Do I buy it? And I, I tell people now, why don't you just wait? See what people say. Be more responsible. I find that responsible investing now requires a context, not a catalyst. I mean, don't you feel? Well, I'm, you know, I'm purely top down. Right. So, right. Uh, and and so professionally, I don't do any bottom up analysis. Personally, I own one stock, um, which is Charles Schwab. Sure. That's how. Well, I'm a lot of part, I own part of the way I get paid. The <laughs> We're the part same, of, but I own Comcast in the street. You have a right. strong buy on the name. Uh, I was, yeah, <laughs> I have a personal strong buy on the name. Everybody. But you believe that to create the past, you still have to listen to but the But I calls. do. So I'm, I'm not. I'm not sitting for an hour individually on right. calls. But the the commentary from them. Uh, from a macro perspective right. is extremely important. I totally agree. Extremely important. I find that when, when I try to get from an economist how the tech sector is doing, it's not nearly as valuable as listening to the conference calls in the top 10 companies to get a tone. I mean, right. one of the things that we've heard this quarter is that the data center is a great sector of the theme. But you don't get that from the economists. They would never be that granular. Right. But, a sec but the data center is driving a huge number of stocks. It's also driving the economy. You know, Speaking big. of the economy. All right. You can drive the economy. This is why I don't think stocks are overvalued. All right. Because we have, they're based on earnings right now. Stock prices are based on earnings. Earnings are based on 3% plus 3% plus now 4.5% GDP. Maybe, wow. Well, that's what Atlanta Fed said. Atlanta Fed now, said yesterday that the fourth quarter, it's early. Might it's be early, and their, their normal miss in being they, always high granted. at the very beginning of the quarter is a percent and a half. But they're a lot so, higher than I like the wrong. three would I, be still yeah. nice. I like the, the St. Louis Fed because they wait and they, right. and they give us well, the Well, the New York Fed, it's just wrong every time. <laughs> but, uh, but, but I do think that we might be pricing in sustainable growth, which hasn't happened in Maybe so that long is what's happened. that people don't understand that historical valuations mean nothing. They mean nothing. We're, we're normalizing monetary policy, which means we're going to normalize volatility, right. which means we're all going to get sick to our stomachs at some point over the next year. But and we're and we're moving into the the capex phase of the cycle, which I think is still sort of underappreciated, oh, underreported. You see durable goods we're, orders, yeah. Uh, not the durable yeah. goods orders, but within that, the the, uh, the capital goods orders. So buybacks wow. have rolled over, but earnings have continued to go up, and earnings tend to drive capital spending. I, I care so more I think about the earnings the than the buybacks. Cycle. I mean, look look at you. You get these food companies, and they're minus. You know, you'll be on one of their phone, their calls, and they're so proud that they're plus one. Now, Heinz, Kraft Heinz was plus point three. It, and they buy back, you know, they want to make an acquisition. I mean, I'm on this conference call yesterday for Cummins. And the Cummins screwed up. They had a quality problem. But they're talking about 25% year over year. I mean, I don't want to buy back. I want 25% year over year. I mean, when we get these, and we, we do a lot together on this, when we, I look at this and I say, do I, I was looking at the Kraft Heinz uh, deck this morning, and I'm trying to find one positive thing to say, because I know a lot of people own it. I want to try to help people. Like people like household names. I couldn't find anything. Right. You know what else? Something we look at too is is the dividend. And we haven't talked about dividends yet. We've been talking about capital gains, right. um, but you see these companies like Cummins and, and Caterpillar and Boeing, you know, 25, 30 percent increases in in their dividend. Right. A real positive signal for you know their near term outlook. Yeah, then you, you compare that to no. like General Electric, which is uh, well, we're you know <laughs> more I, than wrong. This guy uh, <laughs> wrong here. We yeah. talk about GE all the time, and one of the problems with GE was I'm going to use kind words here. The accounting was opaque, but when you have a company that says they have seven billion dollars in free cash in cash flow, 
And then the new CEO it dramatically revises it. And then there's this guy, Tusa, who's been the ax. He says there's only $2 billion. Is it really possible that a major American company could be reporting a number that is overstating the cash flow by $5 billion? I mean, it's pretty outrageous. And they made it as confusing as they could. Yes, they did. Right. They used all sorts of metrics. And there's all kinds of deals going on, so right. everything gets reset. I know. It's, it's, it's What's well, the proper valuation for this stock? It's how very we, hard. How do we know? We talk about this all the time, because Jeff and I, have been, we've been saddled with it. And, you know, look, we've made mistakes. I've, everyone makes mistakes. And uh, it's been uh, very, uh, very tough, because I love, I think that the vast majority of American companies are incredibly honest. And I'm not saying that GE was dishonest. I'm saying that they obfuscated it because if everybody thought it was good, including the board and the board members that I know, uh, and Nelson Peltz, who's a very smart investor, what you end up thinking is like, well, it's not my fault. But then again, I always find we're dealing with a situation first data right now. And uh, someone convinced me, and I spent a lot of time on the company, just spent a lot of time on the company, and, and we were more bullish than we should have been. And now we're trying to adjust. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, they had some, uh, some of their joint venture problems, um, you know, with, with their, um, in their payment space. Um, you know, we, we still like their shift from being defensive to a more aggressive company with their acquisitions. They, they bought Card Connect about six months ago. They just announced last week um, a, a blue pay acquisition that sent the stock to $19. Um, but then they reported that this past Monday, now it's da uh, back down to 1730. I mean, we're going to wait for now. We're going to revamp right. the position. No, yeah, there's no, no, no hurry to it. All right, so I'm, I'm in a jam, guys. Um, thankfully, my father left my kids some money. He did it at ages, you have to be 28. My kids are 26 and 23. 28, 35, 40. If you had my situation, 28, 35, 40, so now you're talking about a, a time frame of a couple years for my 26-year-old, but, you know, but 35, 40, what would you tell me to do? Just round the table. What should I do? I am a, in a complete uh, quandary. I, there's still a lot of cash. Uh, because I've been waiting for the big dip. Uh, there are a lot of people who are watching are probably very similar situation. They may have soured on the stock market, but when they get, you know, an inheritance and, uh, or when they're trying to figure out college plans, they have no choice. They can't just sit there and say, you know what, I don't like stocks. I don't like individual stocks. I don't like the market because there's so many people in cash. But if you're looking at my situation, I think it's almost imprudent for me on, uh, for someone who's tw 23 to not invest that, that per the money f uh, that she's going to get when she's 40 because we know the compound rate of dividends and what matters. What do you tell me to do? Well, the and problem, when? The problem is all, all that you've told us now is the age of your kids. Right. Nothing else. One of the biggest mistakes I find investors make is they tie age to, uh, to risk tolerance. As if longer time horizon, you're a risk uh, tolerant investor, shorter time horizon, you're not. Well, I don't care how That's young very you are. true. You know if that. If you are going to obsess over what's happening in your portfolio and freak out at the first 5 or 10% drop and sell, I don't care what your time horizon okay. is. You are not a risk-tolerant investor. Right. So what drives me crazy are the cookie-cutter answers to a question like that. I'm 23, what do I do with my money? And too often, somebody actually answers that with precision around how much to have in stocks. And there is so much more that goes into the structure of a portfolio than age. But is it prudent just to be in cash? How about that? No. If you if you want to under earn the rate of inflation, if that's your well, goal, that's then it's I'm absolutely prudent. See, and that's what I don't right. want to do. You have, you I'm faced with that, and uh, and I'm worried because I know I'm doing badly because I think I'm going to un under earn inflation, but at the same time, uh, my endless possession with waiting for the the four to seven percent dip, so that I will be more feeling like I mean, look, my, you're absolute. I totally agree with you that the cookie cutter's bad, but I also find, and I can't own individual stocks for that. Right. I also find that uh, should I buy a mutual fund or a guy I really a woman, guy or gal I really trust I'd buy S and P, but I is my obsession with waiting for a four to seven percent pullback because that's my risk tolerance wrong. Well, it's what many, 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 many people have been doing, which and is why the market's done. I think and, it's I, done. and I haven't invested. You tell me. I, I think you and I speak about this all the time. If you're, 
It depends how active you are as an investor, I guess. Well, we if, can't be if, active. If you're someone you know, who's I, not going to pay attention, then you want to be an This is just mutual fund, fund but, and that's all I can do. But I mean, with an individual stock, if I want to build a long position over time, I start out usually with 10 to 20% of how much I want to be long. I okay. think that time is a, right. an important point. So Jim, why wouldn't I be able to be right. so, for a year or two that you, you're are getting fully invested right. in? You know, maybe you pick up that four to seven percent during that time. Investing should never ever be about a moment in time. It should always be a process over time. The okay, so get for in, my, get right. out is for the my four hundred one k. Here's how I well now I don't because I'm so old that I'm gonna have to pull my money out, no. so I don't want to put it in. No, we know the <laughs> we have the tables. But I I used to put in one twelfth every month. I would make the commitment, but if we had a big ten percent drop, I would then front load. But yes, I had it as a process, and I made it so it was unemotional. Because the emotions make it so that you pull out, yep. you do the wrong. Yep. And I always remember the great Peter Lynch said that the reason why you can't do the pull out is that, that there's only a couple days of the year where all the performance is made, and you will be. He, and you, you, you have to make the decision twice correctly. Yes, that's very The in and hard. out. It's not just a one time decision, it's a, a, a two time decision, and, and you, it's hard enough to get one of them right. right. All right, so let's talk about. Uh, a couple of things that people have told me they really love when, when I did my last rent of including a, a very high profile coach in the NFL. I will not reveal because uh -huh. that was not why he, he was struck by the fact that I said that I love the euro. And I said, I love the euro because the interest rates are so low over there. And I see a major turn, you know, and every time I, I mean, I'm on a conference. I, I was on uh, the Dow DuPont. Europe is so is by far the best market. Uh, does anyone feel that there's risk to the dollar? Does anyone like another currency? Because a lot of the sophisticated investors who watch us are saying, you know what? I wish I didn't have everything in the dollar, but I have no idea what to do in order to diversify away from the currency. Yeah, you? Jim, you know we like the euro for the, for the charitable trust, so we think Draghi's going to eventually have to raise rates. Um, you know, they have a... Uh, a overload of, of immigrants in the region that they're going to have to put to work. The economy is going to keep, uh, keep moving along. It's going to keep booming. Um, and we like, we like the European exposure. Um, so that's why we keep the, the EZU. It's an unhedged ETF. Um, we keep it unhedged because we like that euro currency appreciation. And um, it's also, it's, uh, it, it, it leaves out all of the Brexit risks. It, it doesn't right. include London, <laughs> which is important. Right. And, um, you know, and, and we think it's fine with what's going on in Catalonia and Spain. No impact in here. It's it's more heavily involved in in, in the Germany and the France, the, the stronger European regions. Uh, that's that's why we keep that there. We like to. Well, you're also coming CEO. from a good valuation point too. The euro mm -hmm. euro was maybe not artificially low, but but near historically low, and the dollar was near a historic high. Right. Yep. So so that's come back down this year, although it's turned back up a little bit. But I. I, I, I still think that that dollar is going to be drifting lower as Europe comes around, as as emerging markets are but recovering. That's not like a, you know, I can tell you that's not a consensus view, and I like your view. I'm with you. I agree with that too. By the way, I think the dollar, the DXY at least, which is heavily weighted toward right. the euro, right. is approaching a 38.2. Fibonacci retracement from, if you start at the highs of 2016, go through the lows of 2017, you head back up, is that it, it ends are? up around 95.82. I also think that the so you can currencies see some have become um, more sort of popular investments. There are more vehicles through which, in particular, individual investors can access day trade, which means the sentiment environment has become increasingly important for even currencies. Explain that to me. So we, we're, we're all taught, rightly so, that sentiment in, at extremes at least in terms of the stock market, tends to be a contrarian indicator. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the unbelievable euphoria in 2000, the unbelievable despair in 2009. Uh, but you, there are sentiment index, indices now on currencies. Which so you, do you can, trust? Um, well, Ned Davis Research, I think, does some of the best sentiment work. I didn't know that. Uh, Ned sentiment Davis work. historically and does some fabulous work. Fantastic. And, and, you know, Ned was originally partnered with my first uh, boss in the business, the late great Marty Zweig, who oh, you know, created the put-call ratio. Know. And so he, he was a pioneer was in a lot of sentiment work. Wa uh, Wall Street, Wall Street week. week, yep. And uh, Called uh, the crash. Joe, Joe DeMena's my friend. And, Joe DeMena's my friend, uh, too. And, uh, yep. yeah, we used to listen to his tape at the hedge fund, and we knew he was really negative, and, and uh, Garzarelli was really negative. I think he did higher quality work. So uh, it was kind of warmed my heart because... Uh, certainly it was because of the 30-year anniversary of the crash, but 
the YouTube video of Marty on with Lou the Friday night before the crash has gotten tons of hits in the last month. Yeah, everyone should look at that. And everyone should, everyone particularly should go young look people at that. who have no idea who Lou Schrukeiser is, who right. have no oh. idea who Marty Zweig is. And uh, I, I've watched it 10 times right. in the last month. Uh, and, and I was working there at the right. time. But so there are indices that track. And I think one of the things that happened, I mean, there were fundamentals, uh, growth in Europe. But I think one of the factors that caused that pretty sharp inflection point and turn in the dollar was that sentiment had gotten really, really washed out yeah. and was so one-sided towards sort of the short or negative side that I think some of what you've seen is as much a sentiment reversal as anything else. True. It's yeah. technically oversold at that point. Yeah. Too. We've been doing a lot of work on companies, and it's really rather amazing that you'll hear the constant currency is the same as the regular, and it's really made the quarters look a lot better. Yeah, I think that's one of the, the, the big differences from 2Q to this quarter right now is they're getting that currency appreciation. Um, yeah. Yeah, it Which really is why helps. we have to stop it from getting any... Well, we hope, yeah. we hope. All right. <laughs> now, uh, th this morning, a as is every morning, we talk about the tax cuts, or I'm no longer the tax reform, however you want to call it. I've gotten quite jaded. I want someone here to talk me out of my cynicism. I feel like that you hear about a plan and then a plan and then a plan and that there really is no plan and that it's not like 1984 where you had the two parties come together. Uh, I'm not banking on anything big. I think it could be, there could be some, you know, we could maybe get the importation of the money back. Okay, that could matter. Um, and I think maybe there'll be something about competitiveness in companies. But does anybody really expect anything big here? I, I, think, I think this is the fact that the decision was made to keep the corporate side and the personal side packed together, I think, has uh, elongated this process. Yeah. Um, I sat on President Bush's Bipartisan Tax Reform Commission in 2005. Nine-member commission, bipartisan, co-chaired by Connie Mack and John Bro. Consensus at the outset was this is a mess. No one would design this tax code the way it is today if you were starting from scratch. Need for reform. But I got to learn firsthand when you get down into the weeds how difficult it is to get uh, done. So um, tell me. I mean, when I, you see I, these I things. Wish, I think if it was just the corporate piece, right. I think that's lower okay, hanging so, fruit. Yeah, and I think right. that could get done. But it gets much more tricky on the personal side. And as long as they're keeping it together in a single package, I, I agree with you. I think and it's repatriation is part of that package. They it can't is, even separate it's, that. It's 12 percent, which is higher than we thought. And, and passed through with 30 percent, which is higher than we thought. I, I, I come you know, for, that's great and that you're on that committee because there's different times. Those were, course, I remember Connie Mack from when I covered the Florida legislature when I was the Tallahassee Democrat. There's a reasonable person. I never thought of him as either both, party. Both John Bro and yeah, Connie Yeah, John Mack Bro were is very yeah. reasonable. We yeah. don't yeah. have, I'm we, looking for the Connie we Mack. We are, wait, there's not a lot of adults in the room these days. And that yeah. makes it very difficult for anybody to From a market's that. perspective, this, the, uh, the small caps have been selling off this week. All right. They, they, they've lagged most of the year. They caught up a little on optimism over tax cuts. Now they're selling off again. And that tells you the market is skeptic. Yeah. Well, I think that's part of why the small caps got a lift. Um, uh, I, I think some of it was tax reform, but I think got a lift. And then they, again, traded at a premium to the large caps without the beneficial earnings profile. So the fundamentals didn't support it. And, and then and the, the cheaper dollar didn't help them right. one bit. Right. But I mean, those would be the companies, a lot of them. Like most of our companies do not pay the 36% because we've got a lot of big internationals. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, these retailers that are beaten up so badly, they a lot of people were in those because they thought, oh, we'll get this big tax cut. That failed. I mean, mm -hmm. It's not something that we're including for action alerts. We, don't, uh, we do not say, you know what, when we battle back and forth, we do not say, but how about that tax cut that come? Right. No, we're not positioning our portfolio based off of these uh, tax cuts, repatriation. Now, that's not to say that we have some names that will benefit from that, right. from that type of events. But we're, we're, we're keeping the downside there. We're, you know, we're trying to make sure that we're investing in the best companies with the best fundamentals right now. And I think that's what's important. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I think that, the, I have to tell you, I, since I'm on a lot of conference calls, uh, to get the sum up, the best fundamentals are these companies that really were getting killed in Europe and it's reversing. It's these tech companies that are in East Asia, uh, Latin America, ex Venezuela, and Brazil. Uh, uh, Europe, they're putting up the best numbers. Japan. Right. Japan. Yeah. Japan, which no one talks about. Japan's you know, I was so mad at myself. Sony reports this great quarter, okay? But I'm not awake for it. Samsung, Korea reported unbelievable quarter. We are not including 
Yeah, but you did the, benefit from that. Yeah, because but, but, you're but, wrong the other names. But people do, right, but, but we are still way too U.S. centric. I'm U.S. centric. I, I admit. probably shouldn't be. This Nintendo was great. The reason why the Dow has been outperforming the S&P is it's because it's got a heavier bias toward the multinationals. Right. And now, right. mm -hmm. all 45 OECD countries are in growth mode. All 45. All 45. 33 of them are in accelerating growth. Okay, so it's wait the first a time all in 10 years that no one's in recession. No one's in recession for the first time in 10 years. No recession, first time in 10 years. And then I was looking at that Christmas challenger number, lowest layoffs since 1997. And what I'm trying to put together in my writings here on Mad Money and for Action Alerts is this notion that we have, just tell us how rare that is, please. Quite rare, quite rare. And it influences your thinking mightily. Absolutely. And it's also the reason why I think the, the market has done as well as it has. Um, I, I don't think it's a function of the president. I think the inflection point in global growth and the inflection point in corporate earnings both predated the election last year. And I think we, you know, it's the counterfactual. Uh, easy for me to say I think the market would be doing quite well regardless of the results of the election. But also, you know, to your point about tax reform, I don't know, you listen to conference calls, you talk to analysts more than I do, but I don't generally know of analysts that have added anything to their forward-looking numbers for no, tax reform. No, 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 Economists no, no, haven't no. done it to their GDP no, numbers. No, no. So. If you go back to the, the corporations a couple of years ago when there was no growth, they had to start cutting. So Caterpillar laid off thousands and thousands right. of people. Now when the market comes back, not only are they benefiting from a leaner workforce, but th there's business in Brazil again. Right? Everywhere. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we've Almost. been dealing with these companies that have done incredibly well now, like a DuPont, this more Dow DuPont. How yeah. many people did they let go? And they're not even done. Right. And I mean, they had a, a, an excellent quarter uh, that they posted this morning. Um, you know, they, they're firing on, on all, all cylinders and across all of their segments. Um, agriculture had some weakness, but materials, um, specialty products, all did well. Their fourth quarter guidance was great as well. Right. Most of all their businesses, they expect to be up, uh, low, uh, single digit, uh, mid teens. Um, yeah, just an excellent quarter. Yeah, and now, there was an activist investor in there, wasn't there? A bunch at, of them, actually. Yes. At, at yeah. Dow, yeah. At Peltz. I mean, I, I'm close to Peltz. And what Peltz saw is this very interesting kind of just anecdotal. Peltz comes in, and Ellen Coleman's running the company. He comes in, and he says, look, I want, to be, I want a board seat. And she said, you know what, let's wait. Let's see how we do. And they wait. They're very patient. And then the numbers are bad, 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 bad. And then he comes back and says, look, I want a board seat. The numbers are bad, 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 bad. And they say no. They then pick these board members who wanted to run the company. <laughs> you know, they were much more aggressive. And now you have Ed Breen, my know from Tyco, who is just a money creator. Played the opposite him, beat him in Philadelphia schools. Didn't Tony Cash take the other side of that trade recently? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no. Hey, you know that John Ledger runs a four, he ran a 406 uh, uh, mile. Oh, from, man. Yeah, not, not recently. No, but okay. I'm trying to get him to go spin, spinning with my wife. She does this Rachel W. is a really great spin instructor. And I have SoulCycle coming on. And he spins every day. He looks wherever he is. He tries to find a spinning class. Uh, Peloton. Now, Peloton. Oh, my uh -huh. God. Okay, so. In my home yes. is a class every day. We, <laughs> my wife has the Peloton, and I cannot believe it. We have a gym in the basement. But she puts the Peloton in the bedroom because she knows that she looks at it every day and therefore has to be it if she can't get in a spin class. And her oh. spin class instructor, it was her birthday yesterday, gave her a, uh, a special one day off and they threw a party for My her. husband lost 40 pounds on it. Are you serious? On the Peloton? Yeah, in four months. Yeah. Well, in four, uh, they, months. in four months. I think they're going to come public. Is he eating right? Did he ever get off it? <laughs> uh, he's, he's, he's even done the two hour classes. Holy wow. cow. Yeah. That's saying something. I know I got to die. Not thanks. anymore. For Halloween, I ate. We had oh. too much trick or treat I gotta get stuff rid of left the candy. over. <laughs> I know. I got to just throw away the candy. Right? I don't no, want it to no, the no. There's so many places you can donate. Really? Oh my gosh! Google it. Uh, there's okay. so many places that are taking. There's a there's a charity that does it for children in East Harlem, and okay, that was the one that my that. local community is I didn't doing. Know yes, that. don't talk. Hey, but you it. mentioned Google. I'm going to talk Fang. Um, I feel that what's happened in the market was there was Fang, and they were the only companies that had growth. And now when I look at a Boeing, or I look at a Cat, or a Cummins, or Parker Hannafin this morning. They have better growth than fat. And that is something I think people at home may not realize, is that there comes a time in a cycle where we are seeing companies that have better growth than Facebook. Better growth. It's a spur. And it's not just bottom line growth. No, it's top it's line top growth. Line yeah. growth.
through sales. We see great sales growth in some of our companies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and just back to some other tech names too. I mean, I think the technology sector is more than just Fang, and there's some cheap names out there still. We have one DXC Technology, yeah, ul ult ultimate cheap name. No one knows what it is because they probably don't understand what it is with its name. Um, but you know, they're a global IT services pr uh, provider. Um, they just announced a big uh, a, a upcoming spinoff a couple weeks ago. They're going to be splitting off their uh, U.S. Um, public services business. It's right. going to do great for the company. They're not going to thrill you on top line growth, but they have so much cost synergies going on that it's about 90 bucks right now. We think it could go to 100. Yeah. And this is um, Lowry, who is a very tough guy, yeah. Lowry. And what I like about this situation is I know that the, it, the name, they got to change. They got to put a real name to it. Yeah. But it, it goes, it, it, SAP sells it 30, yeah, Accenture's 30 times earnings. This thing is incredibly low. And I still find that we can find within sectors there are stocks that are valued incorrectly. Well, Jim, um, you know, there's a lot of technology in the defense sector, for example, right? It's probably some of the- at, We just had a bullpen yeah, name, yeah, Lockheed, Lockheed Martin. Martin. Right, exactly. Some one. of the, the greatest- <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> probably some of the greatest innovations in our, our, our country, right, are, are happening at Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman. And, and now we've got the defense portion of the federal budget starting to rise. Yes. I, I think it's a real good opportunity for, for that group, too. I agree, and the it's president... Probably, you, you do have to watch your... What? Your Why did you there. sell Lockheed Martin? Because price it got to my price target. And I'm thinking, I, I do want to be long Lockheed going forward. But I, I think I can probably get it closer to 300 than it is now. And it's been coming in the last few days, so I'm, I'm hoping yeah, I'm they right have there. Yeah, they have pulled back a little bit. Maybe right. it has to do with... Uh, you know, and I love those favorite mine, Kratos, Kratos Defense, which... I love Kratos. I've we always did, loved and Kratos. And everyone was so mad they did the secondary, but the secondary was fine. Yeah, the secondary is fine, but it's In a, been, it's in been a bull market, a by the way, can we just explain that a secondary can be bullish because these institutions can't get enough? And you have a secondary of a company that we all like... Yeah, there's, you know, they bring it down a little and boom. It's that, coming in a little, though. And I, no, I'm okay. thinking that a lot of folks probably thought after the takeover of Orbital that Kratos yes, was a we'll likely candidate yes. and then nothing happened. Right. So I did take about 35% off in Kratos. Right. One um, area that is that has been uh, a little difficult to predict of late is oil. And there, we keep hearing about the glut in the U.S., although in the last Schlumberger call they said that that glut is running out. Uh, oil's going to 54, 55 without any champions at all. What's going on? Anybody? Saudi Arabia? Yeah, Trades I'll, I'll tell you what, 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 what brought it back from 28 into the 40s where they finally cut production, right? All of but the, not our country. Yes, our country, when they started cutting production, that's when it picked up. It, it but we're going to be our up. rear more than we produced. Right, so, so then it, it, it came yeah, back well, down. That's and what it, I'm thinking. What's that? I'm thinking Demand. global. Right. Demand. Right. Both, but it, that's what's happening. You know, I mean, if you ask me, if I, someone put a gun to my head, I'd first say take the gun away from my head. But I think there's global demand, and we're not, once again, everybody's too negative. Global demand is here, and we're seeing it from our company. I mean, you do not, I'll, I'll give you a great example. Uh, I had American Electric Power on. Now, American Electric Power is the most plain vanilla utility. And they beat the number big, even though they were really shut down by the hurricane in Texas. And why? New businesses opening. That's where more power is used. More factories opening, longer shifts, more aluminum being made, more steel, new core. Mm -hmm. These are things that we haven't seen. And I think a lot of people uh, are so used to no growth at all that they don't realize that you can have a scenario where people are building factories again. People are building factories. I went and I talked to Andrew Livers from Dow. It is amazing. He's building a huge number of factories in the Southeast because we have the lowest feedstock in the world. This is a big sea change did for our country. Did you ever think you see U.S. Steel report a good quarter like they did? Without any help from the president on the Chinese? I know, I mean, without 232. We talk about 232 all the time. And can't you argue, too, that the global... Uh, the growing global synchronized economy is supporting this glo uh, global demand for oil yes, as well. Yes, and you know, I think we all kind of act as that the world, uh, perhaps because of technology, perhaps because of these countries are like a Japan is, you know, the aging demographic, and we're wrong. I mean, the numbers out of Japan, uh, by the way, the, the corporate numbers out of Japan, but the Japan market, now you could say it's phony. I don't know, because the, the government bought, bought a lot, but the fact is, I wake up and I see a number out of Nintendo, and I say, well, you know, what was I thinking? I mean, Japan's growing. They did spend 30 years in the dungeon. I know, but Japan's a big economy. It matters. They use energy. They're an importer. 
They, all the, you know, Chenier thinks that they're going to do well because of Korea and Japan. And Chenier is building the largest factory complex in America, which is the export of natural gas. And it's 10,000 workers going to work every single day who did not have jobs two years, you know, well, actually four years ago. I mean, these are jobs, it's one of the reasons why jobless is so low. I mean, if you want, if you can get a Greyhound bus ticket, if Greyhound still works, I don't I think know. they do. They do, do they? Do. Not just when uh, Morgan Freeman goes to first time when he I goes don't know. to. I haven't used Gray, Greyhound since. Say what, Nail? But, since I used to go to Camp Lejeune from New York City. They, yeah. they, well, I, I did not have to show I went to Camp Paradox. Is that the same kind of thing? But I, 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 I look at, at what's happening and I don't think it's heralded enough. Or if you heralded it, I mean, I don't want to talk political, but you know, there is a change in the environment. And you speak to, uh, to Brian Jordan, who's the uh, CEO of First Horizon where, you know, Heartland, Tennessee. And he says, big change, it's a big change in the country. People want to take risk, which is why I think that the PAL is important, because if they want to take risk and you, and you can get a loan, you can expand, it matters. It matters. Animal spirits. Animal spirits, hard to judge. People haven't seen them in so long. No, they've been hurt for a long time. Right. Maybe people, they forgot they can get hurt, but that, let, that's have, still gonna help in the short term. Do you have people who are coming back after all these years where they've been driven out? I must say, in the last month or two, I have noticed maybe not a 180 degree shift in sort of attitudes and sentiment, and uh, but but the 120 degree shift for this entire bull market. 95% of the questions that I get, either when I'm out on the road speaking at events, through and the you do a ton, channels, right? I, I mean, do a ton. I'm on the road every week. Have been. What keeps you up at night? Why aren't you worried about what's the next bubble? All negative. Uh, all negative. And just in the last couple of months, there's been a, a, a shift. And they're, they're not, they're, it's not euphoric, it's not right. circa well, 2000, right. but they're opportunistic questions. And it's the first time I've gotten more than a handful of opportunistic Sorry, I'm this questions. Down I'm always looking for stuff to talk about on the show. And, uh, you know, I, I would argue that we at Schwab have a pretty good eye into the mindset of individual investors. Right. But over three trillion in client assets. So all 120 of which are degree shift. Okay, would, right. Yeah. If it was 180, then we obviously maybe we should be worried. I mean, we're not. I mean, at a certain point, we know if everybody gets too optimistic, we'd be. There's trouble. always the Bitcoin question thrown. Oh in my there. God! Oh, Please, oh my alone. God! I know I shouldn't have said it. And boy, oh, I'm and kicking myself so, for I mean, setting it. But the other day, it, I, I got a check. $7? I got a check for sixty-seven dollars from uh, my uh, residuals for a Good Wife episode I was on. Where oh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin was at I 200. I said, right. I said, this thing is a huge, this thing could go up forever. And I was being cross examined on this uh, by Bob Balaban, uh, who's a brilliant man, a uh, uh, great actor, a great writer. And I, have, I asked yesterday to get the tape because I got to get these people off my back. I want to say on record, eight years ago, I knew that Bitcoin was good. And then I got this, I belong to this club. My wife got me in this club. Never would have taken me otherwise, just you know. <laughs> and um, just kidding. And, and, and the Winkle, we call them the Winkle buy because the you know the two guys, the Winkle, you know the, the yeah, Facebook yeah. guys, sure. and they're real. And they they got it right. Don't and you think they benefit from scarcity? I mean, well, I think it's, it's once way, it's way, tradable, so it's going to come in. Did you see what Amazon just did as it relates to the no. cryptocurrencies? I just read this this morning. They just registered three new domain names. Oh, AmazonEthereum.com, AmazonCryptocurrency.com, AmazonCryptocurrencies.com. And then apparently three years ago, they have one that's AmazonBitcoin.com, which if you click on it, it takes you to the Amazon site. We, I got to tell you, I have all the cybersecurity guys on. And all of them are dealing with ransomware. And ransomware is all paid in Bitcoin. Uh, there's a 1-800-DESK. So when you're about to get hacked and you don't want to get hacked and you're trying to stop it, you call the 1-800 line and you pay them and then they drop, you know, they, they don't expose you. Uh, I mentioned that on air and immediately heat seeking missiles at Jim Cramer on Twitter. That's not what it's used for. No, I mean, I'm saying it's used for many things. It's just that it's a great illegal way to transfer money. Yeah, nobody's anyway. buying pizza with it. No, no one's <laughs> buying. What about those pizza stocks? What about the NFL? Did you see that, that Papa, John's Papa John's says their sales the went down because of the NFL? <laughs> He's got to blame somebody. I'm, I, I, how about, you know, because did, fewer people watching, therefore, fewer they, ordering pizza. I guess because they're big advertisers definitely. and Peyton Manning's their guy. Yes. Uh, well, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm cynical, but I did like the pizza trend because I believe in the state, we believe in the stay-at-home economy heavily. Mm -hmm. 
Activision Blizzard, which is about to report. Well, not one too. You've on that? Oh yeah. I mean, that's a good story yeah. that I want people to be, you know, be thinking about or members of the club, but they don't have to buy it before. And again, don't want to play that game, but it's no. a. Yeah, I mean, we like Activision Blizzard. We, we looked at some of the other video game names in that space: EA Sports, Take Two. We liked Activision Blizzard because I, I you know, I think they're the the video game conglomerate. They're the leaders in uh, in mobile. They, so they have the Candy Crush. Right. Um, they have their. Um, you know, a Call of Duty, they have their console games, and with the console, um, PC games, they have Overwatch, and which is eSports. And we think eSports is going to be a huge thing. They just announced today that they uh, have two more sponsors now on the, uh, for their upcoming Overwatch League, and it's multi-year deal, so it's not going to be a one-year fad. Right. It's going to be a long-term thing. And I think thing. it will be NCAA. I mean, yeah. I think that NCAA be desperately wants to have sports where you don't have to be 6'5 and weigh 300 and not mm -hmm. go to class. And Maryland has a very good team. Uh, free, free, sport, free sports, and I have a friend who bought a franchise, uh, which is already uh, way up in value. He told me this summer to do it with him, and I didn't listen because I, I'm focused on this, but esports is real. I will tell you this. Activision Blizzard is the only stock that soldiers ever ask me about, and these guys tend to be 17 to 25 years old, and right. they will open up an account at Charles Schwab at E-Trade and Ameritrade just to buy that stock. Wow. You know, we have Zev, who works with us, mm -hmm. who was in the Israeli army, and I, we were asking him what's the difference between Call of Duty uh, and real life in the army. He said, well, there's no reset button. Which I thought was a but you it know, makes you more fearless. sports in the NFL, <laughs> I was just at a conference before this. I did a panel, and uh, preceding us was Scott Galloway, professor from NYU, wrote the book for. Um, and he showed a, a graphic of the rising age of pro sports watchers on television. And demographic it, issue. But the take is that our generation, baby boomers, liked to watch more than we like. They like to watch people sweat as opposed to sweat your, themselves. And he said the millennials are opposite. Oh, they true. would rather That's sweat themselves uh, than watch well, other people rather, sweat. Rather sweat than put. I'm, yeah. I'm stealing everything. You know. <laughs> <laughs> you know That's what I, I'm here for. I did uh, by, uh, in 2000 and, um, uh, 11, the NFL asked me to speak at their owner's thing, and they had sponsors there. And I did, this apropos of Papa John's, I did a analysis of everybody, about how the sponsor stocks have done, and whether there was a correlation. Of course, like the NFL was Phil, I did it, but it was, it was remarkable. It was, it was Domino's, it was McDonald's. I mean, you know, they, these, you know, they great long-term names, but uh, yeah, the dem there is a demographic shift. Yep. And I think that the, the, it's a lot, I had Tyson on last night, and Tyson really wanted to come on to talk about uh, antibiotic-free chicken and protein, because millennials are, if they know that it's antibiotic-free, they buy. If they think it's got antibiotics, they don't. They are, they are fortunately for them, addicted to health. And you know our generation not. I mean, I go outside and I see people smoking, and I, I say to my wife, you know, because I call my wife as soon as I leave her. I just tend to you know, walk in, and I pass the smokers and I say, "Why are we on the peloton? Why are we on the damn treadmill? These people are like, I mean, how can they get away with it?" And she goes, "Relax, it's not you. It's not you." But it's true. I mean, the physical fitness buffs yep. are very, or you know, they're they're for real. There's just we found not a lot of ways to play the trend. No, um, certainly not Under Armour. <laughs> okay, so no. I, sp I spoke to, um, I, I was very, uh, some people thought I was intemperate when I said that I thought that Nike really crushed them and that uh, I don't know when they can go back and they've lost their way. So I get over to, to, Mab, to my Englewood Cliffs office and she says, call, call Kevin Plank. You know, you sit there for a second and you say, all right, what do I do? What's it going to be? Is he just going to hammer me? And so I call him, and he says, you're right, I lost focus. You're right, I apologize. You're right, I didn't do it right. And it stock's 11. It makes me, makes me intrigued when you have a guy who recognizes what he did. And what, I got a bottle of his own, I got a bottle of his own, he made this, you know, people like Rye, you know, they like, I don't know if you know uh, High West, it was bought by Constellation Brands, what a stock. We love it. We're trying to figure right. out what to do. Yep. But he created his own rye brand, uh, high-end rye, and he sent me a bottle. And I sent him back a notice saying, I thought you were making Under Armour. And he lost focus. What is rye? 
Scott. Whiskey. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, like American, rye, bye yeah, bye, yeah, American yeah, yeah. pie rhymes with rye, okay? Yeah, it's just yeah, spread that's very popular in New York. Yeah. <laughs> but he said, Why I shouldn't have done it. And he said, I'm done. I'm not going to make any more rye. And I said, I said listen, I am going to go out and say that that's the beginning of when you want to buy a stock. Now, Nike, Mark Parker, you should never trifle with him. He's a very quiet man, but he's a lot like Buck Knight. And, you know, you get in these situations where you have Adidas has come back. I'm meeting with the CEO of Adidas next week. Uh, you have Nike. They, they crushed it. And now, I mean, when my daughter was captain of a field hockey team at Summit, she got to choose what they got to wear, and they all wore pink Under Armour. Mm -hmm. And I'm hearing Under Armour, they don't wear it anymore. The kids don't wear it. You know if well, they don't wear it. the college football uniforms. This is not statistical or anything, but you notice they all have little Nike swooshes. And wow. All the Under Armour signs are gone. I have a Reebok jacket. Um, which is Adidas, and I wore it on the sidelines, the Eagles, and they, they said, get that jacket off. The Nike spotters are in the audience, and I'm like laughing, but that's what I'm talking about. The Nike spotters who, are about, who just are about squashing Reebok and crushing Under Armour, and people, I think, don't understand the dynamic of companies. You may own a company like Under Armour, and you may think, Kevin Plank, everything's great, and then you talk to Mark Parker, I talked to I happened to talk to Phil Knight because there's a fabulous book called Shoe Dog, yeah. and I said, "What do you think about Under Armour?" Crush. You know? so people should understand when they buy an individual stock, they should be thinking about the competitors, because nobody's in a vacuum. I mean, I remember we uh, I always like Johnson Johnson, and then because it's a AAA balance sheet, I love a AAA balance sheet, and then they had problems making Tylenol, and then Perigo moved in aggressively. And do you know that they're still not back? They still do not have the shelf space that they had. And it was something that everyone just said, that well, that's a great gross margins, Band-Aids, you know, baby powder, stuff like that. And they never came back. That business is still underperforming. So you always got to think about who came in. The private label came in, and people realized that the private label product was every bit as good. Now, I don't like the stock of Perigo, and I don't like Treehouse, where numbers were cut today. They're private label uh, for supermarkets. But people have to think about this. I find that people don't understand... A lot of times when they own a stock, that they own a competitive company. And everybody wants it. If a company's doing great, people want to kill it. That's what happens. You know, one that isn't quite like that has been a ADP, right? Which has done well, but still has attracted an, an active I thought that was investor. outrageous. I mean, now, look, I had them on. Let them tell you, we're talking about active. Okay. Um, but at the same time, I, I, I had Carlos on. And why not go after underperforming? Why not go after GE? Tell you the truth. Yeah, when, when somebody good is on CNBC or Fox Business, I unmute the TV. I don't unmute the TV for him. Whoa, for Ackman? <laughs> no, I don't really. You didn't like that Herbalife stance where he said he converted to puts because there was no much less risk, and yet he was on TV saying that the, the least risky trade in the world was to short Herbalife and it's going to go to zero? Well, that, that didn't work. Not that we want to no. own Herbalife. No. I just don't want his thoughts in my head. Yeah. Well, okay, so to wrap it up, uh, because we're going to be a little sector-oriented, and we can be also stock-oriented. For the favorite sector or favorite stock within a sector, um, let's go around the round table. All right. Well, Jim, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to cross sectors, because I think some sure. themes sometimes do cross sectors. And I touched on earlier that, that double-digit dividend growth is, is something we're really looking for for our clients, because it gives that signal that clean balance sheet, focused on shareholder return, plus an upbeat outlook for the market. So, you know, I, I, I mentioned Boeing as a company or I Illinois Tool Works. I love Illinois Tool. Um, we, yeah. we love Illinois Tool. You know, Stryker. The yields, the sweet spot of yield, it's, it's not the 4% yield. It's like the 1.5 to 2%. Right. But it, the stock's it's, going up a lot. Right. And, and, and they're consistently increasing that okay, dividend. so let's understand that for people at home. You're looking for a company to raise its dividend. Do you look at the consistency of raising the dividend? What are you looking at in terms of, is it a delta where they're raising it more, or is it well, just they just are addicted to giving you a better dividend? We're looking at, uh, what we like to see is five years of double-digit dividend increases. So it's, 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 it's not a big subset of, of companies, maybe 120, That's 150. All it is? Yeah. Really? Yeah. That's very interesting. I, I think the average dividend growth has been coming down and the average dividend growth for S&P 500 is maybe around 4 or 5%. So these are companies... A, I mean, if people are listening to that and they may want to look at the 120, they, what website do they go to of yours? Uh, ArgusResearch.com. It'll be there. That's terrific. That's a great way to think about it. So that's a the theme. Okay. Uh, tech. 
I think it's growth at a not so unreasonable price. Tech sector is not trading out of whack relative to the overall market. That distinguishes it from 2000. Uh, financials, uh, net interest margin story. I think the Fed, um, I think the market's going to have to catch up to the Fed and the dot spot's going to narrow by the market moving up to the Fed, not the other way around. So two to three rate hikes next year. And then as a bit of a value story, healthcare. Healthcare. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid of healthcare. That's our most recent upgrade. I'm afraid of healthcare um, because it's just but almost, rates almost a purely uh, I mean, value. Not, well, story. When I say afraid, I mean that there's more there's more risk to healthcare than I've seen in a long time, and I think some of that's synchronized global. But the companies are inexpensive, yeah. and they're great growers. So two kind of growth stories and one more of a value okay. story. Don't sell your tax. Focus, okay. focus on the semis. You want to get long energy because you're probably underexposed right now, and I I do think that this is a place for oil where it may take off. I mean. We thought 50 was a level, then we thought 52 was a level, then right. we thought 54 was a level. Now we have a shot. We have right. a shot at 58 here, right. honestly. Uh, I still like Apache. I've played that like a Stradivarius. We reported I've this morning, it was actually turned a profit. Right. profit. I still, still think Schlumberger goes somewhere, and I absolutely love the job that Valero's been doing. We, yeah, Valero's good. The, the uh, marathon Pete number was fabulous. Oh, and the banks, like, like Liz Andrews okay. said, the banks are undervalued. And I'll let yeah. you speak for us. What Of the ones that were close, that we like as ones, which is the way we rate stocks. Yep. Yeah, so Jim, so you know, we, we like to keep four little indexes within our own portfolio. So we keep a, a value index, an uh, income important. index, growth, and a blend. To know yourself, which we think is important. Yep, so just uh, rounding down that list, income, we still like Dow DuPont, mm -hmm. you know, great quarter. We think there's a lot of value to be had there. Growth, Broadcom, they raised their uh, they raise, uh, revenue guidance this Nobody morning. Nobody care, but they did it at the wrong time. Yep. And they did 9.35. Yeah, and once the brocade uh, deal closes, that's just going to be accretive for the company. Value, financials, we like Citigroup. It's still uh, trading at a... Long city. Yep. Very inexpensive. It's, it's book. Price, Tangible book. It's still one of the lowest in the group. And, um, and blend, Apple. I mean, Apple, we always say... You know, it's an investment, not a trade. You know, right. we're high on the, on the iPhone 10. We think it's going to go higher. Right. And again, um, not saying buy Apple ahead of the quarter. The quarter right. doesn't work out. People get mad. It's not like that. You can buy half before, whatever you want to do. Long term. Right. Now, I just, I'm going to finish on Apple because I like Apple. I always say oh, own it, don't trade it. I had the good fortune to have it for an hour, the 10. Oh. As a loaner, okay. Uh, I showed it to my wife on her birthday yesterday. She has a 7+. plus. Uh, it's a loaner, so I have to give it back, but I can get one November 3rd. And she said, and she loves 7 Plus. We sit there and watch pages. She plays Candy Crush for it. She goes, she's like, right, okay, yeah, loves, loves it. And she said, <laughs> I need the 10. This is amazing. And I will tell you, I'm getting the 10. I have the 7 because I am, and this is the last comment, I'm a Philadelphia Eagles fan, and I take hundreds of pictures, <laughs> and they're all blurry. And I saw the telephoto lens on the 10, and I felt like I was a Sports Illustrated photographer. And the expansion, you take a picture, you can see players' faces. You, everything. Yeah. everything. From how far? This, I told them where I am. They said it's not a problem. Hey, and I am. Wow. Oh, if you're uh, seven and one, I would take all the pictures that you can get. Oh, I can't stop yeah. taking pictures. I think it's a trap game against the Broncos. Well, anyway, Johnny, <laughs> thank you, Liz Hansler, old friend. Sarge, read you every morning. Jeff, thank, thank you for you. all the great work. Your Allergan piece, I think, was brilliant. And I know Brent Saunders thinks it was, but he thinks it's an earnings story. I know our friend Doug Cass is shorting Allergan. I'll take the other side of the trade. Thank you very much.